Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, I had planned to stay away from Napoleon content for a little while, but I was looking over the uh, demographics of my channel and what people were watching, and this video popped up called The Simple Reason Why Nobody Could Defeat Napoleon. And I confess that though this is a pretty big channel, it's called Thoughty2, I've never seen any of their videos before. Uh, and it seems like he's got a lot of rather interesting historical content. And I've occasionally seen his stuff pop up uh, in my recommended videos, but for whatever reason, I haven't gone to any of them yet. So we're going to do that today. The link is in the description in case uh, you are anything like me and for whatever reason haven't discovered this channel yet. That's about a 36 minute video, so this will probably be a pretty long reaction. But I thought in light of the fact that the Napoleon movie really didn't do anything to show us the brilliance of Napoleon as a general and why he was so successful on the battlefield. I thought it would be good to dive into some of the background into that. So that's what I'm hoping this video is going to cover. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, so it should be fun. It should be interesting. Let's go ahead and dive in. Hey, 42 here. Napoleon Bonaparte is one of the most influential people in the history of mankind. Yeah, and you absolutely. don't have to take my word for it. That was the conclusion reached in the 2013 book, Who's Bigger?, which ranked historical figures in order of their significance. Of the 100 billion or so members of our species... All right, I'm going to pause right there and look at this list. Interesting. I don't think I could... I don't think anybody could argue with Jesus. Uh, regardless of what you think about Christianity, Jesus, any of it, I can't... I can't even begin to comprehend how we could argue that anybody else has been more influential throughout the history of the world, the, the written history of the world, especially the last 2,000 years than Jesus. Muhammad certainly deserves to be up there. Napoleon, I think that's a very deserved place. Now, in time, that might change, of course, but they got me kind of curious about this book now. These that have lived and died to date. Napoleon Bonaparte came second. The French meet in a religious sandwich between Jesus Christ and the prophet Muhammad. Napoleon is probably most famous today for his brilliance as a general. He led his troops in more than 80 battles, winning a staggering 90% of them. No other general in recorded history can even come close to matching those numbers. He practically invented modern warfare, and it's no exaggeration to say that he is probably the greatest military genius that's ever lived. But his story is a surprising one. For example, did you know that the most famous Frenchman in history didn't Isn't even French. speak French until he was 10 years old? I've said this before and I'll say it again. It's always been fascinating to me that some of the most well-known figures who led nations weren't from the nations that they led. Napoleon wasn't French. He was Corsican. Hitler was born in Austria but led Germany. Joseph Stalin was Georgian but people think he was Russian. Uh, granted, Georgia was a part of the Soviet Union that Stalin led, but um, you know those are just a few examples, and I'm sure there are others as well. Alexander the Great was from Macedon. Uh, you know, his father was Philip of Macedon. He wasn't technically Greek in the strictest sense, I suppose, but you know, Greece didn't really exist the way we think of it today. Or that he very nearly gave up on his military career yeah. to write saucy romance novels. Oh my gosh. And let me tell you about the writing. I mean, I've been learning a lot about this lately. This is something I didn't know about Napoleon. He did. I mean, early on in his military career, he was writing all kind. Like, he was a prolific, not only letter writer, but story writer. He loved writing stories. Neither did I. And there's more. When he wasn't terrorizing the rest of Europe, Napoleon found the time to broker the biggest deal in the history of real estate, accidentally helped mankind to translate Egyptian hieroglyphics, yeah. and put together legal, economic, and educational reforms that quite literally changed the world. 100% true. Oh, and one of his distant relatives was the voice actor who played Chef Louis in The Little Mermaid. Yeah, that's also very true. He was the 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 pastor in um, The Patriot. He's been in a lot of other things too. He is the great, great, great grandson, I think it's three greats, of Napoleon's sister Caroline, who was married to uh, Napoleon's uh, Marshal Murat. 
Rene uh, Abergonis, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce his name, uh, is their great, great, great grandson. And of course, his grand nephew, Charles Bonaparte, was the U.S. Attorney General who, af- who founded what became the FBI. I think that might actually be my favorite random interesting fact of all. That's time. awesome. There's really no other way of saying it. Napoleon Bonaparte lived one of the most incredible lives in history. Here's how it went. By so the far, way, I really if, like this channel. like me, you also think it's about time to do something to protect our planet's ecosystems, stick around until the end. There, I have an inspiring recommendation from my friends at Planet Wild, huh. an environmental protection organization that you won't want to miss. Napoleon was born on the French island of Corsica on the 15th of August, 1769. Well, I say French island. Just three months before Napoleon executed his first successful military advance through his mother's birth canal, <laughs> Corsica had been an independent sovereign state. My French- kids refer to mothers as spawn points now. ...invaded after buying it from former owners, the Republic of Genoa, and most of the locals, understandably, weren't too happy about it. Yeah. Despite being six months pregnant, Napoleon's mother, along with his father, joined the Corsican resistance, fighting a bloody guerrilla war against the French invaders. Most historians consider the Siege of Toulon to be his first major battle, but I beg to differ. Baby Bonaparte took part in his first war as a fetus. It ended up... His first war, yeah. Uh, and his father's pretty young. His parents are pretty young when he's born. He's the second child to survive to adulthood his brother joseph was older than him uh and he's very close to his mother who lives through his reign um his father died long before that Uh, unfortunately it seems that uh, the males in the bonaparte family uh especially the males anyway had trouble with stomach cancer and issues like that being one of the few losses of his career france was the richest most populous country in europe at the time and the corsicans never really stood a chance but anti-French sentiment remained high amongst much of the population, including the young Napoleon. Yeah. Which is why he wasn't best pleased when, at the age of nine, his father shipped him off to a fancy French boarding school on the mainland. So his father gets a, a job basically as like an ambassador to France, uh, and uh, Napoleon, through most of his young life, is a staunch Corsican nationalist and. Uh, is really does not identify himself as being a Frenchman until things don't work out in Corsica. It was a big change for Napoleon, and he absolutely hated it. Technically speaking, he was as French as a camembert baguette, but he couldn't have felt more foreign, which isn't all that surprising, really, considering he didn't actually speak French, only Corsican and Italian. He picked up the lingo pretty quickly. So... Let's see, what's that say? Hey, friend. new kid, new new boy. Uh, il est, it is C si petit. I'm not sure, small. It is, he's, he's, he's short, maybe they're saying there. Um, but yeah, I mean, but he picked up the language quick. And, and kids tend to do that. They pick up the language pretty quickly. I have a niece who was uh, uh, born in Guatemala, came to the U.S. at the age of five, not speaking any English. And within a year, she didn't speak any French. She only spoke English. Only Corsican I mean, not French, and Spanish. Italian. He picked up the lingo pretty quickly, but he would never lose his Corsican accent, even yeah. as an adult. A year later, he earned a scholarship to the prestigious military academy at Brienne le Chateau, and he despised it every bit as much as he hated boarding school. His classmates were all the sons of French aristocracy. And whilst Napoleon himself descended from minor Italian nobility, his family were by no means rich. He graduated military school at the age of 16 and got his first army posting as a second lieutenant in an artillery unit. He learned fast, and before long, he was one of the most capable soldiers in his unit. Napoleon, during this time, spends every bit of money he gets his hands on on more books. Like, even to the point where he would skip eating meals in order to be able to buy more books. Uh, So, from the earliest times, he is committed to learning. This isn't just about instincts and knowledge that he just kind of had. This is about a dedication to learning your craft. And few people were more dedicated to it than him. And that's the the truth with anybody who's 
uber successful at something, who rises to the top of whatever their profession is. It's a combination of opportunity, of a little bit of luck, but of also of natural ability and ridiculous levels of hard work. It all plays a factor. But the promotions he felt he deserved never came. French society at the time was based on a strict hierarchy. First came the church, then the aristocracy, and finally the commoners. Napoleon was technically part of the aristocracy, but if noblemen were supermarkets, he would have been Asda. And if you wanted to reach the most senior positions in the army, you had to be Waitrose. Never heard of either, but No okay. matter how hard he worked or how good he was, Napoleon would always be held back by his heritage. And this is one of the things that about this time in history is so unique is that I see a lot of parallels between Napoleon and a guy like Alexander Hamilton here in the United States, both born outside of the place that they would eventually become an important member of leadership in. Uh, Napoleon, born in Corsica, ends up leading France. Alexander Hamilton, born in the Caribbean, ends up becoming an American founding father. Both of them needed some external factors in their favor in order for them to be able to rise from kind of their low station. Not that Napoleon was necessarily like super low station, but there was going to be a, a ceiling that probably otherwise would have blocked him from high command had it not been for the French Revolution. Same thing with Alexander Hamilton in the American Revolution. In fact, he writes as a teenager, I wish there was a war or something that would give me an opportunity to rise above my station. And Napoleon, had he been born in any other era, I've said this before, we may never have heard of him, but he came along at the right time in the right place. Or at least that's what he thought. But then, the French Revolution happened. The social hierarchy that had governed French society for centuries was torn to shreds as revolutionists overthrew the monarchy and stripped the aristocracy of their privileges. King Louis XVI and his wife Marie Antoinette were given the guillotine treatment. And France was declared a republic ruled by politicians elected by popular vote. And one of the things that's going to happen is that, and this happens a lot of times, you replace a system of government that's been in place for centuries and has had strong control. Because this has been, don't think of the monarchy in France in the 18th century the way you think of a, like a modern British monarchy, for example. This is an absolute monarchy. Uh, and they've got a stranglehold on power. And when they remove the shackles of that stranglehold on power, now what? And they try a lot of different forms of government, and none of them really work. So say what you want about Napoleon coming in with a military coup and taking over, but he does bring stability to a very unstable situation. The French Revolution wasn't televised, obviously, but word still got around. And when the rest of Europe heard what was going on in France, they weren't best pleased. In fact, they were furious. Most countries in Europe had monarchies and aristocracies of their own. And this is such a key factor in understanding the Napoleonic Wars. And I've been saying this a lot lately. Most of the Napoleonic Wars were started by other countries. And it was Napoleon and the French that were on the defense. And this is why. You've got monarchies throughout Europe. And this upstart republic in France is not just a threat because it's now different. It's a threat because if people in other countries look at France and France is successful as a republic, they're going to want that too. And these monarchies aren't about to allow that. So they've got to squash this rebellion. They've got to squash this republic and restore the Bourbons to the monarchy before it spreads. And the revolutionary ideas coming out of France posed an existential threat to all of them. 100%. And so Europe's venerable leaders decided to resolve their ideological differences like the gentlemen of culture they were. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, and there's no greater enemy to a monarchy than a republic sprouting up in one of the most powerful countries in Europe. Just kidding. <laughs> they went to war. 
Great Britain, the Holy Roman Empire, Portugal, Prussia, Sardinia, Spain and several other countries formed the mother of all tag teams to lay the absolute smack down First on coalition. France. The War of the First Coalition had begun. And all of these wars, I mean, we call them the Napoleonic Wars, but this is really what they are, is these are wars of coalitions. And every one of them is distinct, and there are at least six of them. For your average Frenchman, having half a continent declare war on you was probably quite scary. But for Napoleon Bonaparte, it was like Christmas had come early. Yep, 100%. There was suddenly a massive demand for capable military men to lead France's army against her countless enemies. And you didn't even need to have stepped foot in a waitrose to get the job. His first taste of leadership came in 1793, after royalist rebels supported by British and Spanish ships seized the port of the city of Toulon. Napoleon came up with a bold plan to liberate the city by storming a hilltop fort in the middle of the night and turning its cannons on the coalition ships blockading the harbour. And this is actually a, a strategy that had been used recently in the American Revolution, uh, just a couple decades earlier. The British are besieged in Boston. They're surrounded by American militia led by George Washington. Washington gets his hands on a bunch of guns that come from Fort Ticonderoga, and they put them on places like Dorchester Heights, which looks down into Boston Harbor. And the last thing you can have if you're the British are these guns that have basically overwatch over your harbor. Uh, and it was a no-win scenario at that point for the British in Toulon, just as it was for the British in Boston. Uh, and Napoleon knew that, and he was able to uh, maneuver himself into the right position at the right time, with the right opportunity, and then he made the most of it. He led the attack himself, taking a bayonet to the thigh in the process. But the plan worked a treat. A 24-year-old Napoleon had just won his first significant battle, and the world got its first glimpse of what the greatest military genius in history was capable of. And he goes from captain up to brigadier general in a very short time during all of this. And that might seem really strange, but it's not as uncommon as you might think, especially in big wars where you have a country that suddenly has to massively expand the size of its military. Look at the United States in the American Civil War, where you have guys like Grant, who before the American Civil War had retired as a captain. And actually most of these guys who are gonna end up high command uh, generals in the American Civil War were like lieutenants, captains, majors, colonels at most before the war. Same thing in World War II, guys like Patton, and Eisenhower and Bradley and uh, you know these guys that are so well-known names that end up four and five star generals. These were like lieutenant colonels before the Second World War broke out. When you massively expand the size of your army, you suddenly need a lot more officers and a lot more generals. Napoleon was promoted to brigadier general, but just when it seemed his grand military ambitions would finally be fulfilled, they were dealt a significant blow. His first posting was to put down a royalist rebellion in Western France. But and during all of this as well, Napoleon spends a ton of time away from the army. He goes back to Corsica. He actually tries to get involved in Corsican politics. His love is still Corsica. He's still a Corsican nationalist at heart. Uh, but that doesn't work out, and then he commits himself fully to the French. He considered the task to be beneath his considerable talents. And so he did what any grown man does when faced with a job he doesn't really fancy. He pulled a sickie. <laughs> yep. He was so miffed, he even attempted a wild career change, writing a saucy romance novel where the leading man bore a striking resemblance to Napoleon himself. He was removed from the French army's list of available generals, yep. and for a while it looked like his military career was over before it had really begun. But that changed in October 1795, when 25,000 soldiers launched a devastating assault on the city of Paris. These soldiers weren't British, and they weren't Portuguese or Prussian. They weren't really either. soldiers. In fact, the army didn't belong to any of the coalition nations. It was French. A huge royalist uprising intent on overthrowing the new government and reinstating... It was really more of a, a mob, like civilians mostly. It's not an army in the traditional sense. 
protecting the monarchy. If it was successful, the French Revolution was over. With only 5,000 Republican soldiers in the capital at the time, the defenders were outnumbered five to one. And this is something that often happens, right? You've got external threats from other countries who want to put down your rebellion, but you also have to deal with internal threats. And one of the reasons why these internal threats get dealt with in what we would see as a very bloody and very violent and maybe inappropriate way is that you have these external threats as well. And if you're the leadership of France, you're like, man, we got to deal with our problems at home so that we can deal with our threats abroad. And to make matters worse, there wasn't really anyone to lead them. Almost all of the senior officers in the army had been members of the aristocracy, and many had fled at the outbreak of the revolution. But as luck would have it, a promising romance novelist by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte happens to be in Paris at the time. He was luck, asked to join the fight. Right place, right time, right opportunity, again. And he agreed, on just one condition, that he be given command. Yep. And the right he amount of ambition. He had 24 hours to make his preparations, but he used the time wisely, concentrating his men at choke points in the streets around the Tuileries Palace, seat of the new government, and setting up artillery at strategic points to create kill zones. The Royalists launched their first assault in the early hours of the morning of the 5th of October. And when the fighting began, Napoleon was right there in the thick of it, staying on the front lines even after his horse was shot out from underneath him. His hastily assembled defensive positions were so effective, they not only held, he lost fewer than 100 men as he convincingly defeated the significantly larger Royalist army. And just like that, he went from angsty romance author to saviour of the revolution. Still only 26 at the time, Napoleon was promoted to General-in-Chief and given full command of the French army in northern Italy. And he's, he's given command of, uh, I think it's command of the Army of the Interior, which really isn't much of an army because it's mainly just security in the, in the, in the state of France itself. Uh, but then he give, gets the command of the Army of Italy, I think, two days after he marries Josephine. He got his first look at his brand new army in March 1796, but what he saw wasn't exactly encouraging. No. Of the 13 field armies under French control at the time, Napoleon's was by far the weakest. His soldiers were malnourished, poorly equipped, and most of them hadn't been paid for months. Morale was so low that several units had mutinied and many more were on the brink. Of 63,000 troops at Napoleon's disposal, just 38,000 were considered battle ready. And to make matters worse, Northern Italy was a coalition stronghold with Austrian and Sardinian armies swarming all over the place. Despite the condition of his troops, Napoleon surprised everyone by going on the offensive within just two weeks of arriving in Italy. And apparently a fortnight was all he'd needed to turn his ragtag band of mutinous mercenaries into a lethal fighting machine. Because and, and this is one of the hallmarks of a brilliant leader. You know, some leaders would have come into this situation and said, I can't do anything with this army. I need more men. I need more equipment. I need more time to train them. They come up with excuses. Napoleon doesn't use the excuses. He uses the army he has and makes the most of it, while also demanding better equipment better men, more reinforcements. He, he recognizes the need for those things, but it doesn't stop him from using what he has and trying to make the most of it. In his very first battle as a fully fledged general, he absolutely obliterated a joint Sardinian Austrian army 30 miles west of Genoa. At the end of the battle, three and a half thousand enemy soldiers were dead. Napoleon had lost just 200 men. Over the course of the next 12 months, commanding what was supposed to be France's weakest field army against more experienced generals in a territory where he was heavily outnumbered, Napoleon went on an absolute rampage, winning 19 of his 21 battles. And it makes me wonder what he would have done with something like the Army of the Rhine, which was up in the north and was one of kind of the, the more elite armies the French had that was better equipped, better trained, 
you know, supposedly better led. Uh, but what they realize now is that this guy can do this with that army. What can he do with a real army? The coalition forces were so comprehensively beaten by the rookie general that they were forced to sue for peace, relinquishing control of northern Italy to the French. Napoleon had ended the war of the First Coalition pretty much on his own, yeah. with all of the Allies, barring Britain, throwing in the towel by signing the Treaty of Campo Formio. That's and that's an important thing to point out there. And, and listen, I am an Anglophile. I, you guys know how much I love the British and all things UK. But honestly, if I'm looking for a bad guy in the Napoleonic Wars, it's the British. This could have all ended so much sooner if the British had been willing to sue for the peace. They're the one common thread in all of this that keeps this thing going. F the two biggest bullies in the European playground doing what they do best, calling each other rude names across the English Channel. After one particularly spicy insult that probably involved frog legs or something, the French ah! briefly considered a full-on invasion led by Napoleon. But after months of planning, he concluded that he didn't have enough ships to tackle Lombard Yeah, they actually the form, I think it's called the Army of England or the Army of Britain, something like that. And, and Napoleon's given command of that army. Uh, and then they just kind of sit there and they, they're never really able to formulate any kind of a plan to get across the channel and invade. Maybe. At least, not yet. That left him with two choices. Sit around being all peaceful for a bit or find someone else to beat up. No prizes for guessing which he went for. At first, his choice of a target, Egypt, seemed a little bit random. But Napoleon had a cunning plan. At the turn of the 19th century, Britain was one of the wealthiest countries on earth, and a large proportion of that cash money came from British India. British trade ships made the journey to the subcontinent by... And, and let's be honest, India is in many ways why the British are able to fund these wars of the coalitions, because even when they're not fighting directly on the continent, they're paying for the people who are. Uh, and if you are the French and you can't get at Britain directly then you find another way of getting at them. Sailing around Africa. But communication between the two nations usually went through the Middle East for the simple reason that it was much faster. Invading Egypt was a double whammy. Not only would it disrupt Britain's links to India, it would also provide a staging point for a future French invasion. As far as plans go, it was a bold one. But when Napoleon laid it out before the French government, they agreed to it so quickly it was almost a little bit suspicious. You see, by this point, Napoleon wasn't just France's deadliest weapon. He was also a national hero. Yep. And that was a potentially dangerous Send him away. Rumors were beginning to spread that sooner or later, the young general would make a bid for power. By shipping him off to... And you have to remember, it wasn't just Napoleon that was thought of this way. This is the mindset of the French in general, is that they are constantly looking for threats not just the threats outside the country, but threats within. You have the whole terror, right? Where all of these people are sent to the guillotine because they're a potential threat to the security and stability of the nation. And so anybody who comes along that has any sort of potential for rallying people behind him, whether he shows a desire for that or not, is a potential threat. Egypt for a year or two, the Republican government was protecting itself as much as damaging the British. On the I gotta say, just so far, not only do I really like his presentation style and the editing style is really good, I don't know if he's got a whole team, because like I would love to make videos like this, I just don't have the resources to pull it off, so good for him. Uh, but also, um, just I, I like his insights, like the, the times that they stop and kind of give some of the reasons behind things happening. This isn't just a telling of history. This is a reasoning of history. This has given us some of the the more detailed kind of, you know, instead of just saying Napoleon went to Egypt, here's some of the reasons why Napoleon went to Egypt. And that's really good. 1798, Napoleon's Egyptian invasion force of some 40,000 men set sail for North Africa. But it wasn't just soldiers on board those ships. 
Napoleon had recently been elected to the French Academy of Sciences. Yeah, and this is such an important part of this, right? And this is just one of the many examples that Napoleon is more than just a general. Don't box him into just being a great military mind. His, uh, his interests, his intellect, and his ambitions were so much greater than just military. Uh, and he did have a real desire to see political reform, to see educational reform, to see the growth of things like science and history and those sorts of things. He realized that this new role gave him the opportunity to spin his invasion not as a war of expansion, but as an expedition of enlightenment. To make it all seem a bit more legit, he brought close to 200 scientists along for the ride. More on what they got up to in a minute. The fleet landed in Egypt on the 1st of July 1798, quickly capturing the city of Alexandria. From there, Napoleon marched about half of his force across the desert to Cairo, where he found 40,000 angry Ottoman soldiers waiting for him a stone's throw away from the pyramids. By this point, everyone in Europe had figured out that Napoleon was basically a cheat code and wasn't to be messed with. But this wasn't Europe. The Ottoman soldiers had no idea who they were dealing with, and since they outnumbered their enemy two to one, they quite understandably expected an easy victory. And that's exactly what it was, just not for them. In fact, the Battle of the Pyramids was one of the most one-sided engagements yeah. in the history of warfare. The Ottoman cavalry was legendary, and faced with wave after wave of charges, Napoleon casually came up with a brand new tactic, arranging his riflemen into enormous rectangles so that they couldn't be flanked. At and this is one of the brilliant parts of Napoleon's leadership is that he was a voracious studier of history and culture, and he knew his enemies. Like, he would learn about them. It's almost at times like he would try to become them in his mind. Uh, so that he knew better how to deal with them. And that, that wasn't just in terms of the military. I mean, he spent a lot of time studying Islam so that he could better understand the people of Egypt uh, who were overwhelmingly Muslim. But, of course, there were Coptic Christians and others. But um, he spent a lot of time trying to connect with the religious leaders in that place, even flirted with the idea of kind of nominally becoming Muslim if he was going to be there for a while. And uh, but he also understood how his enemy operated on a battlefield. At the cost of just 289 French lives, more than 10,000 Ottoman soldiers were killed, and Egypt belonged to France. Not that Napoleon got to enjoy his latest absolutely ridiculous victory for long, because it turned out that the British had known about his little invasion force all along, they just weren't sure exactly where Napoleon was planning to invade. So they dispatched Rear Admiral Horatio Nelson to go and find out. Heading a large fleet of his own, Nelson had spent the previous two months bouncing around the Mediterranean. Like and this is where I need to once again point out that Horatio Nelson was shorter than Napoleon by a couple of inches. Because <laughs> the British loved to talk about how tiny Napoleon was, but he wasn't. And their own hero of this time was shorter than him. Ship-based DVD screensaver. And so, on the 1st of August, he finally found the French fleet anchored 20 miles northeast of Alexandria. The ensuing skirmish was every bit as one-sided as the Battle of the Pyramids, only this time, it was the French getting their asses handed to them. Their fleet was almost entirely destroyed, leaving Napoleon's army trapped in Egypt. Since going home was no longer an option, Napoleon figured he might as well do a bit more conquering. So he pushed east into Ottoman-held Syria, capturing several coastal settlements along the way. But completely cut off from France, he had no means of resupplying his army, and the casualties yep. were mounting. Things got even worse when an outbreak of bubonic plague killed hundreds of his soldiers, and the French And this is still a time in history when Disease is the number one killer of soldiers in the field, not bullets, not artillery, disease. He was eventually defeated after trying and failing to capture the city of Acre. Which has for centuries been one of the key points in all of the uh, crusades that had been happening because of its 
proximity to the coast and accessibility by sea to Europe. A good general knows when to retreat, and that's exactly what Napoleon did next. But without any ships, there wasn't anywhere to retreat to. In the end, he left Egypt in secret, sneaking away on a small vessel in the middle of the night. So a couple of things are going on while all this is happening. Number one, Napoleon is married to Josephine, who's six years older than him and already has two kids of her own. Her first husband had been beheaded during the revolution, and she very nearly followed him had it not been for the downfall of Robespierre. She probably would have met the same fate. He's the whole time Napoleon sending letters back to to Josephine, and there you know some of his letters are quite graphic in terms of describing what physically he wants to do to her when he sees her again, things like that. He keeps asking her to come to him. He's not hearing from her, and so part of his motivation is to get back to Josephine, and that's kind of how the movie spins it. But it's really much more than that because he's also hearing rumors that there's a big problem with the government, and the government's about to fall. And there's going to be a power vacuum. And by this point, some of Napoleon's brothers are getting involved in politics. And so he's got a lot of connections there. And so he's really got a number of motivations to get back to France at this point. His army didn't even know he'd gone. Dick move, Napoleon. Dick move. Kind of was, yeah. Oh, and remember those 200 scientists he brought along? If you're wondering what they were up to while all of this nonsense was going on, they were busy making what is universally regarded as one of the greatest archaeological finds in history. While showing up the defences of Fort Julian on the west bank of the Nile, they discovered a strange slab of rock covered in ancient writing built right into one of the walls. Known today as the Rosetta Stone, it would later prove to be the key to deciphering ancient hieroglyphics, giving birth to the field of Egyptology in the process. So... There's a lot of study already going on into hieroglyphics, and there are some breakthroughs being made, but this is like, again, like a cheat code. Like, this is a massive advance in helping them to unlock uh, these things. Uh, and basically, what it is is you have hieroglyph, you have the same thing said in three different languages. Um, there's demotic, which is kind of like a different form of Egyptian writing than hieroglyphics. You have hieroglyphics, then you have Greek. Uh, and so because they know what it says, they can match up words. And so there's still a ton of work to be done. It's not done. It's not like suddenly now they know the language. There's a lot more to be done, but this allows them to make that work possible. Uh, and it wasn't the only discovery, but this really, Napoleon's foray into Egypt is what really puts Egyptology into overdrive and is going to drive so much of the historical discovery of the 19th century. Anyway, Napoleon arrived back in France in October 1799 to find the entire country had gone to shit in his absence. Yep. When the rest of Europe had found out that the French special scientific operation in Egypt was actually a fully fledged invasion, they decided to form another tag team, kicking off the War of the Second Coalition. But this time, with their best general in Egypt making Ottoman soldiers beg for their mummies, France was losing badly. Public opinion was wavering, and the new French government was on the verge of collapse. What French government at this time is called the Directory. Now there's a Senate, and there's other things too, but the Directory are very weak, and they're on the verge of collapse, and something's going to take its place. And everybody's starting to scheme and, and kind of look into how they can be a part of the next government that's going to replace the Directory. Leon's greatest strength as a general was taking advantage of the enemy's weaknesses, but it turns out he was just as good at exploiting weaknesses on his own side, too. Yep. On the 9th of November, 1799, he gathered his closest allies and overthrew the French government in a coup d'etat. That's a little bit oversimplistic. It, it, there was really the movement for a coup was much more than Napoleon, and Napoleon was brought in as kind of the military muscle behind it. The intent was not to put him in as head of the government. But this is where Napoleon uses his strength and his cunning to maneuver himself into position as head of the government, even though he wasn't brought on with that idea. Stalling himself as first consul and ruler of France. 
the French Revolution was officially over. And rather than an all-powerful monarch, France now had an all-powerful Napoleon in charge instead. And his first order of business was to quash that pesky second coalition. Whilst he'd been gallivanting around Egypt, the Austrians had snuck back into France's territory in northern Italy. Yep. You might assume that now Napoleon was the ruler of France, he would leave the dirty business of fighting to his generals. But no. Surprising absolutely everyone, including his own men, he personally led a huge army over the Swiss Alps, sneaking up on a significantly larger Austrian force that was besieging Genoa. From there, things went pretty predictably. Napoleon won a string of battles against the odds, and two weeks later, the War of the Second Coalition was over. This time, even Britain agreed to call it quits. And this is what's fascinating. is not just that Napoleon wins these wars, but he wins them against significant odds in some cases, and he wins them so quickly, at least early on. For the first time in over 10 years, Europe was at peace. Spoiler alert, it didn't last very long, with no enemy armies to embarrass for the moment, Napoleon had time to catch up on a bit of admin back in Paris. This was the first chance for the French public to see what the legendary general was like at governing, and it turned out he was, well, spectacular. He was really good at it. During his I, mean, I keep saying this, but man, don't sleep on Napoleon as a political uh, and civilian leader. So, you can criticize some of it obviously, but uh, he was fantastic at it. He really was, and this sets him apart from a lot of your traditional kind of dictators. And, and well, is in power. Go. Napoleon completely revolutionized almost every aspect of French society. He introduced a Napoleonic code, which comprehensively reformed and codified civil law across the whole of France for the first time. He modernized the school system, greatly improving the number and quality of schools. He created the Bank of France and reworked the tax system to help the nation recover from the economic toll of the revolution. And he modernized Paris almost beyond recognition. But before we call him the greatest leader ever, there was a darker side to Napoleon's yeah. rule. For one thing, most of the reforms he introduced only benefited about half of the French population. The half with penises. Under Napoleon, women had many of the basic rights they'd enjoyed under the monarchy. And again, let's put this in context, okay? Yes, by modern standards, Napoleon's reforms were very, very, very pro-man. And it's easy to criticize how they kind of basically relegated women to wives and mothers. No different than any other country at the time, though. Uh, and that's not a cop-out answer. It's tough to be critical of Napoleon for basically doing what was already being done and had already been the case in France. It wasn't like he, he sent women's rights back 200 years. He basically kept them where they already were. Removed entirely. Then there was slavery. The French Revolution this was founded is a criticism. on the idea that all men This would. is definitely a fair criticism, much more fair, I think, than the issue with women, as that he reverts them back to slavery, and how he dealt with Haiti was not great. Equal. And one of its major accomplishments was the abolishment of slavery across the empire. But Napoleon quietly reintroduced it in the French Caribbean to help speed up his plans for colonization in the New World. Despite these major shortcomings in the eyes of the French people, well, half of them, Napoleon could do no wrong. And apparently, he agreed, because in the spring of 1802, he gave himself a little promotion, from First Consul to First Consul for life. Yep. Peace in Europe also gave Napoleon time to dabble in his new side hustle, real estate. And Napoleon very, very, very heavily influenced by the likes of Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great. Uh, and you can see some parallels between Caesar and Napoleon, for example, uh, and that was not by accident. And when I say dabble, I mean he sold over 800,000 square miles of land to the US in what was and still is the single biggest real estate deal in human history. Uh, so I said earlier uh, in another video that he basically flipped Louisiana. Uh, because this had been French territory for a long time. 
Then it was given to the Spanish as part of the settlement after the Seven Years' War. And then as part of the settlement in the wars in Europe, it's given back to Napoleon uh, or back to the French, uh, like around 1800, 1801. Uh, but about that time, you're dealing with everything that's happening in Haiti and his expedition to retake Haiti after the Haitian Revolution goes spectacularly bad. Uh, and a lot of the men die of disease and it just ends up bad. And, and, and Napoleon realizes that with all the problems they have at home, they just can't be dealing with an, uh, an overseas colonial empire. And so he knows he really just cannot manage and hold on to Louisiana. So he does what he can and he flips it to the United States after just getting it from Spain. Known today as the Louisiana Purchase, it roughly doubled the size of the United States of America and changed the course of world history in the process. Back in Europe, tensions between France and Britain were rising, and in 1803, British decided to cut the foreplay and declared war. The War of the Third Coalition had begun. Although, to begin with, that coalition was made up of, well, it was just Britain. We really hated the French back then. Yeah. By this point, Napoleon was either the greatest man alive or the biggest asshole on the planet. It so again, look at this so far. You've had three wars of the coalitions. None of them started by France. So this idea that Napoleon is this great conqueror who was bloodthirsty and hell-bent on conquering Europe... That is not the reality at this point. Now, there are going to be some wars of conquest later on. He, but he just takes wars that are declared on him and goes on the attack. It mostly depended on whether or not you were French and whether you had a penis. Either way, there must have been quite a lot of people in Camp Arsehole because during Napoleon's reign, he survived at least 30 assassination attempts. Yeah. And all of those people trying to murder him got him thinking, what would happen to France when he died? Consul for life was great and all, but Napoleon didn't want to just be in charge as long as he lived. He wanted to rule forever. And at the risk of sounding like I am overly defending Napoleon, which, listen, I acknowledge that the guy had his faults and the guy had a lust for power for sure. Uh, and at times he did things that were not OK for sure. But so far, if you're following this story, everything that he's doing is in response to something that was done first to him or to his country. Everything he's doing is reactionary. It's all responsive, right? And becoming emperor, at least the way this story is being told, is also a response to all of these threats and all of these assassination attempts. And that meant it was time for another promotion. In December 1804, in one of the most opulent ceremonies ever witnessed, Napoleon Bonaparte crowned himself Emperor of France. Emperor of the French. Emperor of the French. That is an important distinction. The new job title didn't necessarily increase his power. That was already absolute. Yeah, that's true. But it did mean he could pass on his title to his sons when he died. Yep. His legacy was assured. And this is one of the, the things that you can definitely criticize Napoleon for. It's not just about his own sons. It's also about his extended family. And he works really hard to, to put his family in positions of authority. He starts giving crowns to his brothers. And he starts marrying off his sisters into relationships that they weren't really crazy about. Uh, but that he thought were advantageous for the family. Now, fully evolved into his Emperor End form, Napokemon Bonaparte started to play Gotta Catch Em All with the countries of Europe. Yeah. Playing the part of Team Rocket were coalitions three, four, and five, and Napoleon defeated them just as easily as he'd beaten the first two. To help fight what were now continent-spanning wars, Napoleon essentially invented the concept of mass conscription, drawing fresh troops from across the ever-expanding French Empire. At its peak, his army contained some 600,000 men, almost three times as many soldiers as the British army at the time. So I'll ask this now. If you are Napoleon, especially those of you who, and I know there are a lot, uh, that tend to be more critical of Napoleon, and, I, and I'll 
acknowledge here my bias in favor of him. Absolutely. Because the more I've been reading about him and I've read a couple of books in the last uh, month or so about Napoleon, the more I find myself a fan, at least of the early parts of Napoleon, um, before he kind of goes off the rails a little bit. What would you do differently? How would you have handled you come to a position of power, you see a country that you've come to love and support and want want to see succeed. Uh, let's say you're in the situation of you know the coup is about to happen, but you know the people that are going to take power in that government in that coup probably aren't the best to lead the country, and you're just going to see another weak government. And you know you can do better. And you have all these ideas on how to do it better. Do you sit back and let the weak government take over in a coup? Or do you become a part of that coup and feel like you can do it better? Now, fast forward a little bit. Your first consul. You've been given this power and it was voted on by the people of France. And they overwhelmingly ratified his appointment as first consul. So while he took the government in a coup... It was supported heavily by the French people, and they did doctor the numbers a little bit, but even without doctoring the numbers, he had an overwhelming majority of the people. Uh, So now, while all this is happening, you continually have massive coalitions of all of the great powers of Europe joining up and declaring war on you. What do you do? And when you defeat these countries, only to have them come back a year or two later and go to war against you again, what do you do? What Napoleon does is he starts putting his brothers in leadership positions over these countries like Spain uh, and Holland and Italy and places like that. But what else could you do? He puts them in positions of authority because he's hoping there won't be another war and another war and another war. Was it right? No. It wasn't nepotism, absolutely. What else could he have done? That's my question. Hi. Such a large force was an absolute nightmare to control in the days before the radio. So Napoleon came up with a completely new way of organizing his troops. You're probably familiar with the concept of military corps. Well, it turns out Napoleon invented that. He split his army up into individual mixed arms subdivisions that functioned like mini armies, able to act independently. As a result, Napoleon's giant army was significantly faster and much more flexible than any other. So basically, each of your corps is going to have its own leadership, its own supply, its own cavalry, its own artillery. uh, And then they're set up in such a way that they can all kind of support each other. Which was especially useful whenever he felt like pulling off his signature Mortal Kombat finishing move, the total envelopment of the enemy. Europe was powerless against him. During his reign, he deleted the Holy Roman Empire, a dynasty that had stood for over a thousand years. Think about about the level of historic change that one event is. The Holy Roman Empire had dominated the history of Europe. And I don't mean dominated in the sense that they were the main factor, right? Because you could also say the British dominated and the English dominated and the French dominated. But this is one of the dominating entities of the last thousand years of European history. And boom, it's gone. Did the powerful Austrian Empire no fewer than four times and won countless battles when outnumbered and outgunned often suffering miraculously minor casualties. By 1812, the French Empire spanned most of the continent, and Napoleon had installed multiple family members on various thrones around Europe. But there were two notable absentees from his growing collection of countries, Great Britain and Russia. And there's his downfall, In 1805, those two Napoleon's Nile nemesis, Nelson, had nixed a combined French and Spanish fleet in the Battle of Trafalgar. And Napoleon had never managed to rebuild it. They should have shown Nelson kind of go over too, because he died in that battle. That meant an invasion of Britain was almost impossible now, so he turned his attention to Russia instead. On the 24th of June, 1812... And, and we should give a little background here, right? The British fleet has put an embargo on 
the French and is trying to squeeze Napoleon. They can't defeat him on the battlefield, so they're trying to use attrition and squeeze him to death, much like they're going to do during World War II or World War I against the Germans. So you're fighting a guerrilla war in Spain that is very much led by the, the British, including guys like Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington. Uh, but that blockade is huge because Napoleon's going to try to do a reverse blockade by instituting his continental system and banning trade with the British. And all things are going okay with that. It doesn't go great. But his main sticking point is that the Russians aren't abiding by that. And this is where Napoleon's situation goes horribly wrong because he should have just abandoned the, the continental system. Instead, he invades Russia to try and make them abide by his continental system. Half a million French soldiers marched into Russia. After more than a decade of watching Napoleon kick the crap out of anyone who dared to challenge him, the Russians had absolutely zero interest in trying to defeat him in the field. Smart. The man was obviously invincible. Smart. Instead, they executed a military maneuver that most of Europe had plenty of practice at by this point, the all-out retreat. As they fell back, the Russians burned everything that might have been used by the French army. And this, again, is not a new thing. This is a strategy that has been used for a long time. The Americans used it extensively in the Revolution because they couldn't stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British. And so they would fall back, fall back, fall back, fall back, cause your enemy to pursue and spread out and... and make his supply lines increasingly long, draw him into a situation where eventually you can get an advantageous opportunity to defeat him. The Texas army under Sam Houston is going to use the same strategy against a guy that considered himself the Napoleon of the West and Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. From buildings to fields and key infrastructure. That put a huge strain on Napoleon's supply lines, yep. which only worsened the deeper into Russian territory the French army pushed. It didn't help that conditions were awful. The summer of 1812 was unusually hot, and combined with the long forced marches and the lack of food, Napoleon's troops, many of whom had been conscripted from across the empire, were starting to desert. As the Russian armies moonwalked their way ever deeper into friendly territory, Napoleon's army was weakening. By the time the Russians turned to fight during the Battle of Borodino, he was outnumbered. And this he is won, just a slugfest. But this time, French losses were enormous. I really hope that the situation calms down eventually in this part of the world, because from what I've seen, the Borodino battlefield is definitely one worth visiting, and there's a lot to see there. Hasn't changed a ton, like some places like Leipzig, for example, the later Battle of the Nations that'll come not long after this. Um, and it's a place I would absolutely love to get to if the opportunity ever presents itself. Still, the victory did allow Napoleon to occupy Moscow, meaning he'd done the impossible and defeated Russia. And it's important to remember at this point, Moscow is no longer the capital of Russia. It's been moved to St. Petersburg, and it won't be the capital again for another 100 years or so. But it's still a very important city. One problem. Nobody had told the Russians. Napoleon waited patiently for his conquered foe to sue for peace, but they didn't. In fact, they didn't do anything. They weren't and even the there. French emperor was left pottering around Moscow, ah! looking for odd jobs that needed doing, like a pensioner trying to keep himself busy after retirement. As days turned into weeks, he slowly began to realize he'd made a massive mistake. His crippled army was over a thousand miles from home. And in the words of Ned Stark, winter was coming. If he'd stayed in Moscow, he'd be trapped. And so he did the only thing he could, retreat. Unfortunately, by that point, winter wasn't just coming, it was already bloody everywhere. Napoleon had marched into Russia at the height of summer, and now in the midst of winter, his men had no provisions for the frigid conditions of the retreat. Tens of thousands died from cold, starvation, or disease, and tens of thousands more were killed by Russian raids. Of the half a million troops that marched into Russia in June 1812, just 40,000 made it out alive. 
mm, I wish he hadn't said made it out alive. If he would have just said that that's what Napoleon had left, then they'd be okay. A lot of these other guys were still alive. They just weren't with the army anymore. They had deserted. They had been wounded and left behind. Other things had happened. Uh, but hundreds of thousands did definitely die. For the first time in more than a decade, the invincible Napoleon Bonaparte was weak. Knowing his enemies were waiting to pounce, he rushed back to Paris to raise another army, quickly gathering a force of over 350,000 men. Which is crazy to me, with all the wars that have been fought and all the deaths that have happened, that he's continually able to raise these massive armies. But think about it. Every time you raise one of these massive armies, they're less and less experienced and trained, and you've lost a lot of your really good fighters. So again, this shows the brilliance of Napoleon as a general, that at this point, he's still able to find a way to win battles. And he does win some but he's gonna lose the big one. But they were mostly rookies. It's hard to keep track, but by this point, Europe had cobbled together its sixth coalition to try and deal with the Napoleon problem. This time made up of Prussia, Russia, Spain, Portugal, Sweden, the United Kingdom, and several smaller German states. And Sweden, which by this point, I think is led by Marshal Bernadotte, who had been one of Napoleon's marshals and whose family, whose descendants to this day sit on the throne of Sweden. Despite being vastly outnumbered and commanding an inexperienced army, Napoleon used all his genius to score several major victories against the Allies. But it wasn't enough. With attacks coming in on multiple fronts and much of the French army in full retreat, Napoleon was eventually defeated in the Battle of Leipzig. He Sometimes called the Battle of the Nations, and this is one of the most important battles in European history, uh, and one that doesn't get talked about nearly enough. He forced to abdicate, and Louis XVIII, brother of the previous recently guillotined king, yep. took the throne. Napoleon was sent into exile on the island of Elba off the coast of Tuscany. As a mark of respect, or possibly just to piss him off, the Allies named him Emperor of his new domain. Whatever the motivation, Napoleon took this role seriously, introducing his customary sweeping reforms. In just nine months, he created a mini army, a navy, invested in the island's infrastructure, introduced modern agricultural methods, established an iron mine, and updated Elba's legal and educational systems. See, a lot of people ask the question, why didn't they just execute him at this point? Well, at this point, he is a crowned head of Europe. And to do that would not only make him a martyr, but also set a standard that they didn't want to set. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons why they're better to exile him. They just didn't exile him enough. But after having controlled most of Europe, a small island was never going to be enough. Leading a micro army of 700 men, he escaped, landing in France on the 1st of March, 1815. Even led by the legendary Napoleon, 700 men should have posed zero threat to France. But the newly installed king made a fatal error. He sent a huge army to destroy Napoleon once and for all. A huge army- Basically, he just sent Napoleon a huge army, is what he did. Made up of soldiers who utterly adored their former general. The king's army promptly switched sides and began marching on Paris. There's this very Apparently dramatic scene where Napoleon literally like stands out in front of them and he's like telling them, here's your emperor. You going to kill me? Heck no, we're not going to kill you. We're going to follow you. Uh, but unfortunately, one of the men who was sent out to arrest Napoleon was Marshal Ney, who by switching sides back to Napoleon is going to forfeit his own life. He's going to be executed later that year after the fall of Napoleon. Learner, Louis XVIII sent yet another, even bigger army to take down Napoleon. And yeah, that one defected as well. The king briefly considered sending yet another army, then thought better of it, and fled to Belgium. On the 20th of March 1815, Napoleon marched into Paris at the head of his new army. The king had returned. The rest of Europe responded to this unwelcome news the only way they knew how. 
by forming yet another coalition. We're on the seventh now, by the way, just in case you're keeping score. So at this point, the Congress of Vienna has been going on for a while now, where they're it's basically the 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 representatives of these nations and they're figuring out what to do with the post-war Europe, much like what happens after World War II, where they're deciding what do we do about all of this stuff that we've got to deal with. And they're figuring out how to reform the nations, who gets what territory, all those sorts of things. And they're in the end stages of that. And they basically sign the agreement at the end of the Congress of Vienna right in time to fight Napoleon again. So a lot of these armies are actually still in the field. Napoleon did his best to raise a new army, but there simply wasn't the time. And that left him with two choices. Either turtle up and attempt to defend France against the incoming coalition invasions, or go on the offensive. As you can probably guess, he opted for the latter, hoping to score some trademark quick victories and force the Allies to sue for peace so that he could properly rebuild. Right, at this point he knows he can't win a war of conquest. He can't go conquering all these nations. What he can hope for is go on the offensive, de defeat them in detail before they can combine forces and overwhelm him, get them to sue for peace and maybe hold on to, to France. It almost worked. He led the bulk of Kinda. his force north into what was then the United Kingdom of the Netherlands and is now Belgium where he found himself heavily outnumbered by two coalition Belgium and the Netherlands. ...armies, one British, one Prussian. Fighting both at the same time would have been suicide. So, Napoleon separated the armies by sending the bulk of his forces between their positions. From there, he was able to quickly defeat the Prussians. But the British army, commanded by the Duke of Wellington, put up fierce resistance after taking a defensive position near the town that gave the battle its name. Waterloo. It gave the beaten Prussian army just enough time to regroup and attack. And Napoleon did send a force to kind of screen for the Prussians to kind of make sure that they were held off and didn't work out. Napoleon's right flank, rousing the French army. After winning the first five coalition wars, Napoleon had now lost two in a row. And this time, there would be no sneaky comebacks. The Allies had learned from the mistake of sending him to actually not all that far away Elba. This time, they didn't take any chances. The French Emperor was exiled to St. Helena, literally one of the most remote inhabited islands on planet Earth. Napoleon would live there until his death on the 5th of May, 1821, at the age of 51. He was buried on the island, but in 1840, his remains were returned to France, and they now rest beneath the dome of the magnificent Les Invalides in Paris. Historians can't seem to agree on how best to categorize the remarkable life of Napoleon Bonaparte. To some, he was a tyrant who betrayed the revolution that made him. To others, he was a hero who changed the world, mostly for the better. Some view him as a power-hungry megalomaniac intent on conquering the world. Others believe he was simply protecting French interests against relentless European aggression. Either way. I think if you stop the story of Napoleon, say, in 1805, and the wars all stop, and Napoleon leads France at that point, I think he's remembered as one of the all-time great leaders in history. Uh, like, not just generals, but leaders in history. I think a lot of what happens that makes Napoleon viewed much less favorably is going to be what happens after that. Uh, so if, if it were me judging Napoleon, I'd, I'd give him pretty high marks up until that point and probably lower marks after that. His influence on the history of our species cannot be overstated. 100%. After his death, his many reforms and innovations across law, education, economics, and civil administration were replicated all over the world. Yeah. Some of them remain in place, even today. And something that's in no doubt whatsoever is his almost supernatural military genius. It's hard to sum up just how remarkable Napoleon was, so I'm not going to even try. Instead, I'll leave you with the words of the man who finally vanquished him. In the years after Waterloo, Wellington. the Duke of Wellington was asked to give his opinion on who was the greatest general of the age. His answer was simple. In this age, in past ages, in any age, Napoleon.
There you go. When your opponent who finally defeated you for all, for all time says that, that's about as high a praise as you can get. Um, yeah. Thanks for watching. All right, that was that was really good, and I enjoyed that channel a lot. And if their other stuff is anything like that, I think this will not be the last that we take a look at their channel. So uh, I put the link down in the description uh, if you want to check out more of their stuff. Many of you are probably already familiar with them, but I enjoyed that. Let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.